So good evening, uh, everybody, and uh, thank you, Dr. Mr. Sabnavis, for joining us this morning. As you all know, uh, Mr. Madan Sabnavis is the Chief Economist of Care Ratings, and today we, the talk is about the production-linked incentive scheme, or what it really means for India. Uh, this is, uh, as you know, an experts review series that Vicky has started. Uh, this is the third in the row that we are doing, and it's going to be there with you all every Friday evening. Uh, I did mention to you, Mr. S uh, Mr. Sabnavis is Chief Economist Care Rating, and he is a noted corporate economist with over three decades of experience across macroeconomics, development banking, commercial banking, engineering, and a range of important areas, and of course, credit ratings indeed, and has led several economic and industry research across several organizations. So once again, a very warm welcome, uh, uh, Mr. Sabnavis, uh, to this uh, program. Uh, PLI, as we all know, is really a game changer for the India's manufacturing sector. But as we all know, they will uh, lies in the details and uh, all will depend on, uh, you know, how this gets executed. Of course, government of India has really put in its might behind it. And we do hope that, you know, this will really help in strengthening the Make in India initiative of the government of India. But for that very purpose, we have an expert like Dr. Mr. Sabnafis, who has written a lot about this subject and has, uh, you know, worked on this area. So it'd be great to have your views on the subject. Over to you, Mr. Sabnafis, for uh, your talk. Yeah, thanks a lot, and uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, the PLI scheme, a production-linked uh, incentive scheme announced by the government, uh, to my mind is an indication of the change in the ideology of the government in the way in which support is provided to any particular sector. But so far, I think whenever we look at uh, any assistance coming from the government, it's been more in the form of a subsidy where uh, there are certain incentives given. It could be in the form of cash. It could be in the form of an interest rate subvention. So we are actually moving away from uh, this particular route and looking at something saying that uh, you need to perform in order to get a certain benefit. And I think that is a, a, a distinct change in the ideology of the government in terms of providing incentives. So when I look at the production, in, uh, uh, production incentive scheme of the government, the PLI production linked incentive scheme, <clears throat> essentially what it does is it tells uh, companies that uh, you need to invest a certain amount of money you need to generate a certain level of output. In case you're able to meet both these uh, performance parameters, then there is an incentive given to you in the form of a return, in the form of cash. And uh, this particular scheme, which started off in 2020, I think it's gained a lot of momentum in the later part of 2020 and 2021, because uh, while we had the PLI scheme announced in a big way under the Atman Nirbhal scheme in, in the month of November, we already had this running for the electronic sector in the month of June, so June 2020. So uh, what exactly is this particular scheme about? So what we have seen is that the government has covered uh, 13 important sectors. And these sectors include things like uh, automobiles, electronics, white goods, food processing, uh, specialty steel. So there are quite a few of these sectors which have been uh, included by the government. And of course, there's a lot of uh, work which has gone into selection of these particular sectors. And what I mentioned here are the very broad sectors, but they are actually uh, committed to certain specific products within the sector. So it's not that the entire steel industry gets it. That's spoken of specialty steel. So you're talking of a certain kind. Similarly, when you're talking of automobiles, the focus is more on electric vehicles. So th there have been <coughs> periodic announcements made by the concerned ministries over time exactly giving the details about what exactly has to be done in order to claim this incentive. Now, an interesting thing is based on, again, the release which the government has made, that if everything works out, there would be something like close to two lakh crores of incentive, which would be provided to industry. And this two lakh crores of incentive would actually be leading to an increase in overall output of something like 37 and a half lakh crores over a period of five years. Now, 37 and a half lakh crores of uh, output, if we have to convert it into value addition. So when I say value addition, it's essentially what goes into our GDP 
assuming a ratio of around 35-36%, uh, we are saying that 37.5 lakh crores of output could actually mean something like uh, 13 lakh crores of, um, of uh, value addition, which again, if I divide it by five years, it comes in something like 2.6 lakh crores of output. So if I look at 2.6 lakh crores of output and juxtapose this with my nominal GDP, I can say that approximately I'll be getting something like 1, 1.1%, 1.2% of additional GDP, assuming our nominal GDP is in the region of around 220 lakh crores. So that is the kind of uh, an uptick in overall GDP, which we can expect in case all this works out the way in which it has been designed. Now, the interesting part is that uh, we look at the different sectors and the kind of investments which the government has spoken of. We are looking at uh, something like uh, two and a half lakh crores of uh, investment to be made across these different sectors, again, over a period of five years. And if I look at uh, two and a half lakh crores of investment, I'm looking at something like 13 lakh crores of GDP. So intuitively, we can say that every unit of investment is going to generate something like a little more than five units of uh, GDP, which I think is a very good ratio. And that itself reflects the efficacy of this particular scheme. Now, the question, of course, is that uh, will this really happen? I think that's always a question in uh, India because ours is a very complex economy, different kinds of players in the market, different kinds of sectors, organized and unorganized. And every time there is a particular scheme which is announced by the government, it looks very firm on paper. And uh, at the end of uh, the, the time period when this particular program runs, one may not always get satisfactory uh, results. Now here, I would just like to deviate a little bit and talk about the power sector reforms and the discounts. So I think when they were introduced, it was a rather grandiose scheme. And we all felt that it's a very good scheme. How do you make sure that uh, the distribution companies do well, the power distribution companies? Uh, they of course had a lot of debt, <coughs> running continuous losses. So the scheme actually said that uh, the debt should be transferred over to the debt losses. Everything gets transferred to the state government. The government takes it on the budget and uh, the government starts issuing bonds. And accordingly, the discoms are actually freed of all the debt because 75% was taken by the government. 25% had to be restructured for the financial institutions. This was all very good. So I think everybody was very good, very fast in terms of uh, passing on the debt to the government. But they had to also have certain performance parameters. So the performance parameters are basically, you need to make sure that you uh, no longer made losses, cut down your TND losses, and uh, which actually meant that you had to be more efficient, you had to revise your tariffs. And this is not something which really worked out. So even today, if I look over the five years or six years of we have been through with these power sector reforms, the discoms still continue to not uh, really perform well because it becomes, a, I mean, there's a lot of politics which comes in, which is understandable when it comes to revision of tariffs, and therefore we go into a different kind of uh, trajectory. But here they're saying very clearly that you have to perform, and at the end of five years, you are able to produce the output. You can definitely get this two lakh crores of um, incentive, which will be paid by the government, which will be spread over this uh, period of time. Now, how does one interpret this PLI? So <coughs> there are different ways of looking at it because uh, if you look at the different sectors and uh, look at what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, and juxtapose the same along with uh, what has been uh, proposed by the government, I can think of three ways in which one could look at it. Number one, there are certain sectors like electronics, which are uh, a major component of our imports. And today, if I look at electronics, I look at uh, specialty steel, I look at uh, telecom equipment, I think there's lots of imports which are taking place today. Overall, if you look at imports of electronics, it's more in the region of around 50 to $60 billion. So today, one can say with confidence that in case the electronics industry, the telecom industry, they actually take up this particular challenge, they're able to invest, they're able to produce. So I can look at terms of a fair amount of import substitution actually taking place on account of the successful accomplishment under the PLI scheme. Second, if I look at industries such as, say, textiles, food processing, I think these sectors are very strong when it comes to exports. So here again, one can say that in case uh, everything works out according to plan, 
and uh, the incentive is finally provided because there is performance coming from these sectors, then there will be a boost which our exports would also be getting. So I think the earlier the kind of problems or the kind of challenges which we had in the 70s and 80s when I was a student, when we spoke of export promotion and import substitution, I think that is something which gets automatically addressed in a limited manner, but definitely in a definite manner under the PLI scheme. And more importantly, <coughs> does it help to bring about a kind of a push for overall investment? Now, we have seen in India that uh, the investment rate has been coming down since 2011-12. So if I look at the gross fixed capital formation uh, rate, it was in a region of around 33-34% at the beginning of this last decade. And today it's come down to something around 27%. So one of the major reasons as to why investment has come down is that uh, companies are not investing, infrastructure is not quite taken off. So if the way I look at the PLI scheme is that we are trying to approach uh, the, the issue of investment, not by just saying that let's wait for demand to come in, and then it's when investment takes place. Because the moment a company or industry start waiting for demand to come through, it depends upon the overall state of the economy. So if I look at uh, the average capacity utilization rate in industry today, it's more in the region of around uh, 70%, a little less than 70%. Maybe it'll correct to around 70, 72% under normal conditions. And we typically require something like 78 to 80% of capacity utilization for any particular company to go into fresh investment. So in the absence of this taking or of this taking place or it's taking a long period of time, I think when we look at this PLI, we can say it's a kind of a direct push which is being given by the government, telling the companies to say that, look, you people invest, you produce, you will get this incentive. And at the same time, you'll see that the investment cycle sort of gets a push. So that's a very positive thing. But this also brings in a bit of skepticism saying that uh, I need to see the economy revive. I need to see growth take place, a real growth take place in the region of around 8 to 9%. Of course, the growth this year is going to be a bit of a statistical illusion because of a low effect, because of negative growth rates, things are going to look better this year. But we genuinely need to have growth taking place where demand is created, because we should ask ourselves this question, saying that if I've had a demand side problem, like you know, in demand even before the pandemic came in, have I actually addressed this issue well enough so that when I have a PLI scheme, companies will actually have an incentive to produce because at the end of the day, you need to produce in order to sell. So if I'm talking of things like saying export promotion, yes, industries which use this incentive to produce to export will definitely find this uh, beneficial. If I'm finding, if I'm looking in terms of industries where there is potential for import substitution like electronics, definitely we can see that companies will go ahead because it's a great opportunity which they have. But beyond that, I need to ensure that there is growing demand for the relevant products. Only then will we see companies actually stepping forward. And here I would say that, uh, again, based on the, on the releases made by the government, there have been mention of the companies who are already given in the application. I think the picture is very, very rosy. It looks very positive. Some of the large companies have shown interest in the PLI scheme, which can give us actually hope that the PLI scheme will be very, very effective. It'll be quite different from the other kind of schemes or all the skepticism which some of the economists may be having in terms of uh, whether it will work or not, I think should be satisfied because the immediate response has been positive. Now, another question which comes up here is that, uh, will this really benefit all companies or is it going to be specific to certain companies? When I say certain companies, I'm talking in terms of size. Because if you look at uh, the guidelines which have been laid down by various ministries, uh, do they support investment coming from large companies or is it from smaller companies? Now here I would say that it's of course a mixed bag, but I would say around 70 to 75% of the benefits could actually be going in for the larger companies. And why do I say so? Because if you look at the kind of investment requirements which are there, because these investments will have to be done over a period of three to four years, depending upon how the scheme has been devised. And you need to generate a certain incremental output. Now, I think that is a bigger challenge. Putting in the investment is probably not that much of a challenge. But once I put in the investment, I need to generate incremental output over a base year. 
it could be 1920 or it could be 2122. Again, this varies according to uh, which whichever sector we are talking about. So, <clears throat> the the sense I get is that uh, there will definitely be a bigger advantage because of the way in which it's been laid out. Uh, but as I said, at me around 70% would be tilted more towards the medium to large size companies. But there is still a lot of space which is there for the SME segment because there are certain uh, uh, benefits like say, for example, the auto components, some of the, the, the smaller things like food processing, where I think there is enough scope which is there also for the SMEs because of the investment levels and incremental output which is expected to be generated. So therefore, I think it's a fairly even-handed policy. So though there could be a tilt towards the larger companies, but the important thing will be whether it will be taken up by the smaller companies or not. Because so far, I think all the names which have been uh, seen in the media about the companies which have shown the interest in the PLI tend to be in the higher, I would say, in the higher echelon in terms of size. Uh, we haven't really, uh, uh, we really don't know about whether uh, the smaller companies have shown a similar kind of interest, but that we'll get to know over a period of time whether uh, they, they would be taking up this uh, particular challenge. Because there's also a question of saying that, okay, I'm getting an incentive from the government. This could range between four to six percent. In fact, I've calculated the average would be around five percent is what you're getting across to all the industries. So for some industries like drugs and pharmaceuticals, it could go even to something like 10 percent. But you need to make the initial investment. I need to borrow the money. So this is where I think one particular uh, kind of a hurdle which is there is finance, getting funding for this kind of an investment. Because initially you will have to fund it yourself, and then later on, as and when the, the, the output materializes, you will be able to get the incentive in return. So here, I think the banking situation, the banking uh, system is uh, definitely better positioned. But I think what needs to change, of course, is a mindset because uh, uh, ever since we had the AQR, which came through and uh, banks had to uh, sort of handle this entire issue of ballooning NPAs, there has been a certain uh, <clears throat> apprehension or certain reluctance in terms of lending or there is a preference for lending only to the better rated companies, which has really meant that uh, in terms of willingness, willingness to lend has definitely come down. And we've also seen that there's been a shift in terms of overall lending from uh, the industry and services to the retail segment, because one always believes that when you lend to the retail segment, the possibilities of everybody defaulting is much lower because of the small ticket size. And therefore, the quality of assets tends to remain more stable in case of lending to retail. So that's been the tendency, the trend which we have seen this year. But hopefully, it's a trend which will remain only for this year. And from next year onwards, when things normalize in a better manner, we could be expecting banks to be taking on a little more risk and be more open to lending. The other challenge which, of course, companies will have when they go in for this investment is that uh, uh, the, the, the era of low interest rates may actually be over. So today we are talking of a situation where the repo rate has come down to 4%. It's been here for around 18 months. Uh, this is notwithstanding the fact that uh, inflation has been in the region of around 6%. And today I think any discussion or any kind of conjectures on monetary policy is when will the RBI increase interest rates. So we are actually talking of a situation where uh, the banking sector may be getting out of this issue of NPAs. They may be a bit more confident. But in terms of cost of borrowing, that is something which could always go up. So I think the overall state of the economy, the general state of the economy is going to be one of the main drivers. Because just remember one thing that when we go in for the PLI, you need to make investments in all the next few years. You have to generate output over a period of time. And any kind of uh, business cycle which comes through in the economy, which could happen anytime. So maybe 22, 23 will be a good year. We don't know what 23, 24 is like. So the government has been open enough to say that in case you don't do it in a particular year, you could do it on a cumulative, cumulative basis for the subsequent years. So th there are definitely provisions made in the PLI policy to ensure that if there are any adverse effects on account of uh, business cycle movements, companies could still be insulated and they could, of course, claim it for the, the, the requisite period in which they do they're able to generate this output. So the, the external factor is going to play a major role in terms of determining the success of the PLI, where the companies are able to borrow, the companies are able to make the investment, which means that they also should be in a position to borrow. And here, I think the corporate debt market is another integral piece, 
Though, again, I would admit that if you look at a corporate debt market, it's uh, more a market for AA and AAA rated papers and not something below that. So again, it will be an advantage for the larger companies rather than for the smaller companies. Now, in this kind of a situation, uh, what kind of possibilities can we really see? So what I've mentioned right now is about what looks, uh, what are the theoretical aspects of the PLI and what could possibly be happening in terms of the larger, smaller companies, who gets the benefits, what could be the overall economic benefit for the, for, for the country. But if you look at past experiences, Okay, that's the right way to look. If I could look at the past experiences to say whether we are seeing these quantities of investment coming from these particular industries. Uh, have you seen this kind of an output being generated? That can give us some kind of an idea about whether industry is in a position to actually go in for such kind of investments or generate this kind of an output over this requisite period of time. So at care ratings, what we have done is we actually carried out a very short study to see, looked at some of these broad sectors. Now, when we look at these sectors, of course, they are not the specific products because it's difficult to take out the specific products which come in, industry, in this particular industry, which gets covered under PLI. We looked at the broader sector, like for example, we didn't look at specifically of, of uh, electric vehicles, but we took the overall automobiles and the auto components sector. Similarly for electronics, we did not look at the specific things which go into your mobile sets, but we looked at the overall electronic sector. White goods were looked at uh, at more at the macro level. And seeing that in the year 2019-20, what were the levels of investment which were made and what was the level of the output which was actually achieved? Now, <clears throat> Here again, the picture was a bit mixed. Some of the industries had shown fairly buoyant uh, uh, investment, which gives us hope that this is something which could be sustained. This, of course, does not mean that if companies did not invest in 2019 20, they will not be investing in 21 22, which conditions in changing. Like, for example, post COVID, I think the kind of demand which is there for food products, the kind of demand which is there for pharmaceuticals is much higher than what it was in, uh, in, the, in the pre pandemic area. So, even if the investments didn't take place at that point of time, they could definitely happen this year. So, overall, the 50,000 crores of investment which should be happening on an annual basis in these uh, 13 sectors seems to be a bit stretched, but I think it's something which is still doable. And I feel that even if we do 70 to 80 percent of it in year one, that would be a good enough uh, achievement as far as the scheme is concerned. The broader issue, of course, is about the output. Can you actually generate this kind of an output? So again, it goes back to what I said earlier, saying that we need an economy to recover. We need to see enough demand coming in. When I talk of demand, it's not just domestic demand, but it should also cover things like global demand. So wherever I'm looking at international markets, and today we have seen that global conditions appear to be fairly volatile. We started off the year by saying that the global, global economy is going to do very well. And who's going to drive it? It's going to be driven by Western economies plus China. But I think the whole situation, the whole matrix has changed so much. The China has all kinds of problems. People are talking in terms of a prob probable recession in China in this particular quarter after Evergrande uh, crisis, the power sector crisis, which is there. So we're not quite sure about how the global economy may perform. Though again, getting signal, taking signals from what the Federal Reserve has been saying, it does indicate that the US economy is going to grow and therefore the Federal Reserve will be increasing rates after uh, rolling back on the quantitative easing. So these, these factors are going to keep shaping the global economy. That's also going to be affecting the overall, overall pattern of global trade. And that is something which we should also keep in mind whenever we are doing anything in terms of planning, preparing strategies, in terms of how much of investment should be done now, and what, what, what kind of output is really going to be generated in <clears throat> future on account of these, uh, these kind of investments. <clears throat> so I think the investment uh, target, as I mentioned, would be something which is achievable. Uh, the turnover part will, of course, could turn out to be a bit volatile. So uh, if, you, if, if, if a person is asked that, can we actually get this 37 and a half lakh crores of output over a period of five years time? I think we can only say it may be a bit too premature for one to, to, to jump to a conclusion right now. Suffice to say that we can say we'll have to wait and watch and see whether uh, these numbers really work out because a lot of the things are going to depend upon the external environment, which is both global economy as well as the domestic economy. Because all, all this time we are assuming that there's no third wave or even in case we have a third wave of infection, we'll be better able to counter it. There will not be these kind of stringent lockdowns which we had in the first wave as well as the second. Now, the last part of it, I think uh, one particular uh, 
uh, thought which has been expressed in this PLI scheme is in terms of employment. So I think that's the only place where uh, personally I would not have, uh, I, I, I'm not too uh, enthused about it because the PLI scheme does talk in terms of creating something like one crore jobs. So you're talking in terms of something like 100 lakh uh, people are going to get employed. Of course, it mentions that it's going to be both uh, direct as well as indirect. Now we again here at Care Agents, we do regular studies in terms of uh, how employment has been shaping up in the corporate sector. So when we're talking of PLI, they're going to refer lot, largely to the corporate sector. And what we have seen is that uh, even in the best of years, when I say best of years, that is the non-pandemic years, we haven't really seen uh, corporate balance sheets reveal a growth of more than three to four percent. And even this three to four percent has been uh, pushed up primarily on account of services like your IT sector, the banking sector, the NBFCs, and in the manufacturing, it's been more in terms of your FMCG and uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals. These are the five industries which have really done well. So in this situation, I think when uh, we're talking of uh, 100 lakh jobs being created over a period of five years, whether they're direct or indirect, uh, to my mind, I think uh, one will be a bit, uh, one has to be a bit cautious because we have all been interpreting these numbers. And we've also seen that post uh, pandemic, a number of companies, at least most of the larger companies, are going slow in terms of employment. There's a greater reliance which is there on technology. And we all know that in a labor, labor surplus economy like India, the more technology we use, it could mean that uh, we're making labor requirement come down, labor becomes a little more redundant. And uh, some of the sectors, like if I, if I look at things like uh, the telecom, or I look at automobiles, lots of these things run on the basis of robotics in the factories, there are fewer human beings already. So I think this is one place where I think one could be a bit uh, skeptical whether the uh, 100 uh, lakh jobs are going to be created. Uh, so on the whole, I think that the PLI scheme is uh, a very good change in terms of strategy of the government, that you make sure that uh, uh, companies perform. So it mo it's more like a private sector ethic, like all of us working in the corporate sector, the private corporate sector, we have this norm saying that you perform part of your salary comes in terms of performance-based uh, pay. So it's a kind of a similar kind of thing which the government has brought in for uh, uh, when, when giving this particular incentive. So I think it's in probably the right direction. And if it works, that could be the way to go whenever you're dispensing uh, uh, incentives to any, any sector in the economy. Uh, and then in terms of the, uh, the, the final results, I think uh, investment seems to be very much doable. Uh, turnover, of course, will depend upon uh, the state of the economy, how, how overall demand uh, shapes up, because I think at the end of the day, you don't produce unless there's demand. So this demand needs to be generated somewhere or the other. So, so far, we have seen that consumer demand has been lacking in the domestic economy. So by having a scheme which looks at uh, import substitution, export promotion, as well as uh, domestic investment, Maybe there is uh, some kind of buffering which has been done by the scheme so that even in case the domestic economy doesn't do well, the export part could fire well. Even if exports don't fire, definitely import substitution is required very much. So something like electronics, which has a fairly large allocation, I think in case uh, we're able to produce for the domestic market, it would definitely obviate the need for us to import the same things. So that's something which would, should work out partly for sure. Uh, the only part, as I told you, where uh, there could be skepticism would be in terms of employment, uh, whether we could really create these ma many jobs. Uh, if it does happen, of course, it will be very good for the economy, something which uh, one has always been debating about whether growth has gone along with job creation or not. And definitely, if we're able to achieve even 50% of uh, what we're talking of, I think that would be very good it Would have some kind of uh, a virtuous cycle which would be created by the PLI scheme. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I think you've really made it very easy to understand in a very simple terms. You've explained what this means for the economy. There are, of course, uh, you know, a few uh, assumptions out there, uh, but I think time will tell how it succeeds. Uh, it is at least a great move and we do hope, uh, you know, to uh, see a good outcome of this uh, policy by the government of India. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for, uh, you know, informing our members about this very important uh, area.